Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello and a very warm welcome to the Financial Forecasting and Excel course. I'm Umar Manzer and I have over 12 years of finance experience in organizations all over the world. Throughout my career, I have created financial forecasts for companies in various sectors spanning from logistics to banking. I'm currently working as a full-time freelancer and my clients range from startups to large multinational corporations. I help my clients solve complex financial and strategic questions around financial planning, resource allocation, profitability maximization, and investment management. I also publish financial content, so you can follow me on LinkedIn in case of interest. In my experience, if you lead an organization or work to support the decision-making process of organizations, you're often faced with deciding what should be done next. The decision is easier to make if you knew what was going to happen in the future. Yet, understanding the future is clouded by an increasingly complex world that seems to be moving faster and faster with an ever-expanding array of options. That is where financial forecasting comes in. Forecasting involves making informed guesses about certain business metrics by processing, estimating, or predicting a business's future performance. With a financial prognosis, you try to predict how the business will look financially in the future. It is the historical performance data which is used to make predictions about future trends. Companies and entrepreneurs use financial forecasting to determine how to spread their resources or what the expected expenditures for a certain period will be. If this task leaves your head spinning, you have come to the right place. This course will get you started on understanding financial forecasting in Excel and can help you and your organization improve decision making. As far as the course requirements are concerned, you need to have a copy of Excel. You need to have a good understanding of Microsoft Excel, especially when it comes to the formulas. It will be beneficial if you have a basic understanding of accounting principles and financial statements. But most importantly, a desire to learn how to build a quality financial forecast will go a long way. This is how the course is structured. From sections one to three, we will be discussing the theory behind financial forecasting, which includes how to understand the business, and we will discuss a fictional company called ABC, which will be used as an example throughout this course. We will also discuss the forecasting objectives and key variables and drivers. In sections 4 and 5, we shift gears and delve into the forecasting calculations. In section 6, we round off the course by discussing the profitability and risk and key trends in financial forecasting. Please remember to make use of the exercises in this course. We have one exercise each for sections two, three, and five. The supporting files are provided with this course. I highly recommend that you make use of the Excel spreadsheet provided with this course as we work through section four. Now that we have discussed the course requirements and the course content, it's time to get started. I hope you are as excited as I am as we delve into the world of financial forecasting. I look forward to our association throughout this course. Hello and welcome to module 102, Uses of Financial Forecasts and the Reliability Question in our Financial Forecasting in Excel course. Who uses financial forecasts? How are forecasts used? Are forecasts even reliable? We will be answering these very important questions in this module. Are you a business owner? Do you work in the finance department of a company? Are you an investor seeking suitable investment opportunities in the market? You might be a company analyst trying to determine the fair price of the shares in the stock market? Are you a lender scrutinizing the credit application of a business? Or perhaps you are a consultant 
advising a business on reducing financial risk, financial viability, or the future strategic direction. From business owners to consultants, financial forecasting is a crucial business process to answer questions around profitability, future, or growth. With the help of financial forecasts, we can project revenue and expenses, which then help the business estimate its cash position at a certain period in the future. This may be a standalone role in the larger companies, while it is often incorporated into the responsibilities of finance employees in smaller corporations as well. Now, forecasts play an important role in annual budgeting, strategic planning, ongoing performance management, cash management, formal earnings guidance, and ongoing investor communications. These are some of the most important ways in which a financial forecast is used. It is also worth mentioning here that forecasts are used in debt financing, setting of employee incentive levels, and tax planning as well. However, please note that this list is not exhaustive. Let's address the key question around the reliability of forecasts. I don't have a crystal ball. Are forecasts really worth it? I have been repeatedly confronted with different variants of this question throughout my career, and I believe it's important to address this question early in the course. A reliable forecast is not about providing the complete visibility or certainty. It's about providing a little glimpse of what lies ahead so you increase the likelihood of reaching your destination safely. It's like driving your car at night. You can only see as far as your headlights. But that's all you need. You can make your whole trip that way. It doesn't matter if you drive 5 miles or 500 miles. Shining a light on the road immediately ahead of you is all you need in order to get where you are going safely. The question is, how do we forecast reliably? Predicting the future is difficult, but predicting the past is very easy. Basically, most forecasts simply extrapolate from past trends. It's easy to assume that what happened in the past is the most likely outcome for a scenario in the future, or unlikely outcomes are not worth considering. If in recent years your organization has grown by about 5% per year, the assumption for the coming years is that this percentage will be the same, with small variations to account for capacity, optimism, expectations, and other specific factors but the future rarely imitates the past, especially considering rapidly evolving laws and regulations, geopolitical orders, and economic influences. Predicting the future based on the past data is therefore not unlike driving forward while looking into a rear-view mirror. And then we have striving for precision. Precision is important when it comes to predictions, business plans, and financial models. The thoroughness of carefully examining and modeling each input can determine how accurate the prediction really is. I recall Warren Buffett once said that he preferred being somewhat right or being exactly wrong. Now can you argue with Buffett, one of the most famous investors ever? It's the past trends and the precision which makes your forecasts more reliable. We will be discussing how to create more reliable forecasts further along in the course, but let me give you a brief introduction. Leading organizations use the forecasting process to develop insights into the business, assess future opportunities, identify risks, and refine the business strategy. They enhance the quality and reliability of the forecast information in three important ways. Firstly, they use financial and non-financial information. Rather than building forecasts solely around static, detailed, internal data that are relatively easy to predict, 
leading organizations focus on the key dynamic internal and external business drivers that concern management. Critical issues such as customer demand, competitor activity, and economic conditions. Although perhaps somewhat more difficult to obtain and predict, these measures provide greater value and insight into the business environment than purely internal details. Ensuring strong governance and control. Given that forecasting data is derived from multiple sources and the potential for inaccuracy is high, strong governance and control are needed to ensure data reliability. Finance functions manage and monitor the processes, data definitions, and controls of the month and close with considerable rigor, and they should bring a similar discipline to forecasting. Indeed, leading organizations have adopted rigorous governance and control practices around their forecasting processes, and most importantly, proactively dealing with uncertainty. Despite measures to enhance data quality, forecasting is still difficult and dependent on many factors. Leaders recognize these challenges and make use of a wide variety of methods of varying degrees of sophistication to deal with the uncertainty inherent in forecasting. We have tools such as range forecasts, scenario planning, sensitivity analysis, and simulations that help measure and quantify risks and opportunities as well as facilitate the development and the implementation of contingency plans ahead of those organizations that provide static one-dimensional views of the future. So guys, hope you enjoyed today's lesson. We looked at the uses of financial forecasting, how forecasts are used, and addressed the very important reliability question. It really is an elephant in the room when we talk about financial forecasting and reliability. As I mentioned earlier, we will be discussing how exactly can we make our forecasts more reliable further in the course, but let me leave you with this thought. A forecast shines a light on the dangers and opportunities that lie ahead. We need to think of it as a tool which provides the heads up you need when a financial problem is brewing. It gives you time to figure out a solution or find ways to minimize the potential negative impact. It helps you see financial problems or challenges far enough in advance for you to develop and implement an action plan to solve the problems before they arrive on your doorstep. Hello everyone. Welcome to module 201 financial components to determine business health in our financial forecasting in Excel course. Before we begin forecasting, you have to keep the larger strategic purpose clearly in mind so that we understand what we are trying to achieve with the exercise of financial forecasting. This is where understanding the financial health of the business comes in. With a big picture mentality, we can truly appreciate the benefits of financial forecasting. Business leaders who adopt and maintain financial forecasting best practices are better positioned to grow and weather unexpected setbacks. While it's impossible to predict the future, as the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated, hedging effectively against worst-case scenarios gives the business a fighting chance to adapt. The fact is, companies don't end up well capitalized with strong balance sheets and healthy cash flows by chance. Financial health is a function of vigorous data analysis, deep familiarity with the business, and up-to-date customer and market insights. Finance teams that get forecasting right in good times share in the company's success. And then we have the elements of financial health. Financially speaking, your challenge in the business is to generate above average profitability and cash flow while making your business worth more and more money in the long term. These are some of the elements of financial health. Now let's dive deeper and see how these elements fit together. 
There are three elements of financial health, namely profitability, cash flow, and net worth of the business. To gauge profitability, we have to understand the following aspects. The ultimate test of the business is whether it can consistently and predictably get and keep customers. Having healthy margins is about selling at a price which provides value to the customers and healthy margins for you. Growth is about scaling the business up and getting even more customers. Cost discipline is about keeping the expenses in check so that you bring a solid percentage to the bottom line. Now looking into the cash flows. Profitability is an important driver of cash flow. But the speed with which you convert assets into cash is also very important. Assets like accounts receivable and inventory have a big impact on cash flow, especially as the business grows. Capital expenditures or capex are the purchases you make in the longer term assets necessary to sustain the existing business as well as to invest in future growth. Debt levels and debt service obligations play a large role in the sources and uses of cash from month to month. And finally, net worth. Net worth is crucial to financial health. Allocating excess cash is about deciding how much to retain and reinvest in the business and how much to distribute to the business owners. That's the beauty of the business that generates excess cash. You have the money to continue to invest and build the company or you also have the flexibility to distribute some or all of the excess cash so that owners can invest in assets outside the business. Both are designed to help increase your net worth over time. So in a nutshell, your financial success in the business is determined by how well you drive profitability, which drives cash flow, which drives net worth. Driving profitability, cash flow and net worth higher over time will ultimately determine whether you have money or not. And this is where financial forecasting can help. It will help you think seriously and strategically about what needs to happen in each of these areas of the company in order to be successful. The question now becomes, how do you determine the financial health of a company? You need to analyze the balance sheet, income statement and the cash flow statement. Firstly, the balance sheet is a statement that shows a company's financial position at a specific point in time. It provides a snapshot of the company's assets, liabilities and owner's equity. The income statement shows a company's financial position over a period by looking at revenues, expenses and profits earned. It can be created for any period using a trial balance of transactions from any two points in time. The cash flow statement provides detailed insights into how a company used its cash during an accounting period. It shows the sources of cash flow and different areas where the money was spent, categorized into operations, investing and financing activities. Finally, it reconciles the beginning and ending cash balances over the period. Now let's take a look at the financial statements of a publicly traded company. Starting off with the balance sheet. Assets are what a company uses to operate its business. Liabilities refer to the money that's borrowed from other sources and needs to be repaid by the company. And total equity represents the financing that the owners, whether private or public, put into the business. It's extremely important to note that the assets should always be equal to the liabilities and owner's equity. Both assets and liabilities are displayed as either current or non-current on the balance sheet, indicating whether they are short-term or long-term. Short-term assets are those expected to be converted to cash within a year, while long-term assets are those that are not expected to be converted within a year. Short-term liabilities, on the other hand, 
are due within a year and long-term liabilities are not due within a year. The balance sheet provides information on the company's financial health by helping you analyze the following. How much debt the company has relative to equity? How liquid is the business in the short term? What percentage of the assets are short term? How long it takes to receive outstanding payments from customers and repay suppliers? And finally, how long it takes to sell inventory? The business keeps on hand. Now let's take a look at the income statement. The income statement generally starts with the revenue earned for the period minus the cost of production for goods sold to determine the gross profit. It then subtracts all other expenses including staff salaries, rent, electricity and other non-cash expenses such as depreciation to determine the earnings before taxes. Finally, it deducts the money paid for tax to determine the net profit for the owners. This is also called net income. This money can be paid out as dividends or reinvested back in the company. The income statement provides information on the company's financial health by helping you analyze the following. How much revenue is growing over one accounting period? The gross profit margin for goods sold. What percentage of revenue results from net profit after all expenses? If the business can cover its interest payments on debt. How much the business repays to shareholders versus how much is reinvests in the business. And finally, the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement is one of the most important documents to analyze the company as it provides key insights into the generation and uses of cash. As mentioned earlier, it shows the sources of cash flows in different areas where the money was spent, categorized into operations, investing, and financing activities. Another important point to note is while the income statement and balance sheet are based on accrual accounting, which doesn't necessarily match actual cash movements of the business, the cash flow statement exists for a reason. They remove the impact of non-cash transactions such as depreciation and provide a clearer financial information to owners and investors. The cash flow statement provides information on the company's financial health by helping you analyze the following. The liquidity situation of the company. Company sources of cash. Free cash flow the company generates to further invest in the business. And whether overall cash has increased or decreased. That wraps up this session. To summarize. We discussed some important components to determine business health. It all starts with the big picture mentality, which enables us to narrow down on the elements of business health. We also had a look at the financial statements of a publicly traded company and discussed some of the key questions that financial statements can help answer. Hi guys, welcome to module 202, Role of Forecasting in Strategic Planning in our Financial Forecasting in Excel course. Another component of thinking strategically about financial success is to think about the larger goal of financial forecasting as a tool for helping you build your company. Think about that. When you know where you are going and you have a plan to get you there safely and on time, you will feel a sense of courage, confidence, and peace of mind. This is why financial forecasting is such a powerful tool in business. In essence, it forces you to think strategically about your business and where you want your business to go. So let's look into that. Today, in many organizations, management and financial analysts tend to focus and spend significant efforts on analyzing historical sales, current income data, and cash flow as a path to guide for the assessment and interpretation of financials and growth in revenues. 
but there is an increasing need for organizations to shift their focus and time towards the strategic indicator which can act as the key determinant of sales growth, financials, or valuation. That is financial forecasting. Forecasting as a strategic tool is becoming increasingly crucial and indispensable for business value. For instance, an organization's enterprise value financially is based on its present discounted value of its future cash flow projections. Through forecasting of future cash flows, you can develop a game plan for achieving the earnings objectives. Insights into the future, say for two to three years ahead, can help evaluate the viability and effectiveness of your business strategy with a focus on meeting longer term goals. Financial forecasting as a strategic tool has the following attributes and correlations to your business aspects that you need to understand and leverage. The ability to make longer term forecasts on a company's resource requirements and financials such as revenues and cash flows. Insights into a longer term horizon can help elucidate the effect of improvement in organizations' new plans and capability building measures which has less relevance on a shorter term. Forecasting as a strategic tool can help reaffirm your organization's industry and market position. Forecasting that is accurate and that can quantify uncertainty can provide deeper insights about how your industry and market is evolving and your addressable market share in a national or international market. The available strategic options for business growth based on forecasting can provide a conjecture about what sort of new resources and capabilities you require and how you can steer growth towards results. And lastly, your organization's projected growth rates and profit margins, especially given a longer term, should shed light on the industry competition and your differentiation. So, if you forecast higher growth rates, you must explain the core drivers, competitive edge, sustainable factors, and how much further you would penetrate the markets. Furthermore, projecting into the future and an after-horizon post-mortem assessment would seek actions for change, remediation, and improvements from your other business departments. Great forecasting can drive stakeholders across your organization to think, plan, and act effectively in ways to meet your business growth and financial targets in each industry context and market dynamics. Therefore, your organization should consider assessment of outcomes of forecasting performance as an opportunity to learn and understand business gaps and challenges and hence be informed and prepared for fine-tuning its choices in business. Aligning your forecast with strategic objectives is another crucial step. You can begin to align your forecast with the company's strategic objectives and goals. Are you planning to buy new equipment to increase productivity? Is there an opportunity to expand to a new geographic market? Consider your plans. How will they impact your financial position? You would want to think about three scenarios that can impact your financial forecast in this stage. You have the best case scenario, for example. If you are successful with any objective, what would the impact be? Can you sustain growth? Do you have all the resources you'll need? In the worst case, if we fail, how damaging will it be? How will it affect our business, our employees? And the most likely case, what will most likely happen? What are the potential outcomes that fall between the best and worst case scenarios? If you run through these scenarios, it will help decision makers compare potential outcomes to the company's business as usual model forecast and decide the best course of action. Let's look at some of the benefits of setting a financial strategy. As you put together your financial forecast, you will develop a plan of action for your goals and objectives, which will guide you and your business activities to improve business performance. The benefits of having a financial strategy include clarity on the key drivers of your business. You have to find out the key aspects of your plan that need to be achieved 
in order for you and your company to reach your expected results. Tools to measure and monitor performance. Your financial forecast can include key performance indicators such as minimum monthly sales, maximum level of expenses, and you can measure these against the actual results. By having a budget and comparing this to actual results, you'll quickly see what's working and what's not and make changes so that your profit can improve easily. This is what improved profitability is all about. Increased efficiency while using resources. Monitoring your resources to budget expectations will ensure you get the most efficient use of business resources. For example, you can look at the time taken from customer order to order completion of the job and then payment and then determine if the time frame can be shortened. This will mean the company receives the payments quicker and have your staff move on to the next job earlier and make more money in the process. Forecasting tracks all these financial outcomes thus making it a valuable tool. Now let's take a look at an Excel template that can be used for setting a financial strategy of a company. This template will be provided with the course resources. Now a little about the template. You can create a business financial plan using this template. You can use the costs template and the PL template worksheets to keep account of costs and profit and loss. And there are also a couple of example tabs that contain sample data. These examples will help you understand how exactly to use this template. Let's have a look at the overview tab. This overview tab provides further instructions into using this template. Firstly, let's look at the cost template tab. Imagine you have a coffee shop. Of course, there are some costs associated with this coffee shop. The cost can be advertising, employee salaries, employee payroll and taxes, rent, postage. So you can use this tab to capture all these cost items. Let's take a look at an example. Using the cost template, you can capture all these cost items and arrive at the total estimated budget to start your coffee shop. In this example, the estimated budget is slightly over $24,000. Please feel free to play around with this template. Now let's take a look at the PL template tab. So using the PL template, you can capture the revenue, the cost of goods sold, calculate the cross profit, and also the expenses. Let's take a look at an example. Before we begin, please note that this is a historical PL forecast. And secondly, you will learn how to create a PL forecast from the scratch later on in the course. So stay tuned. Using this spreadsheet, I have populated some figures. If you look at the year to date view, we see the estimated product sales were $216,000, added some more items for sales, returns and discounts, service revenues and other revenues to arrive at the net sales figure of approximately $215,000. We deduct the cost of goods sold from this figure to arrive at the gross profit of $128,000. And we also have the expenses for this coffee shop. The major chunk of the expenses is salaries and wages, as you would expect. We also have market and advertising spend. We also have sales commission and rent. So if we total all these expenses, we arrive at the total expenses line. And the income before taxes is when you deduct the expenses from the gross profit. That takes us to the income before taxes of $16,518. Of course, there's an income tax component as well. We have an income tax of around $2478 to arrive at the net income figure of around $14,000. Please feel free to play around with this template and see how exactly you can break down your business strategy into the financials. As a coffee shop owner, you can identify exactly what your financial position is 
You can spell out your business strategy in terms of revenues and expenses. You can do a number of analysis, such as the break-even analysis, and you can also identify if you should look towards revenue maximization or cut costs. For instance, in this example, in the month of October, the coffee shop had a loss of $553. So you can identify why exactly that happened because it's all transparently laid out in this spreadsheet. We are now at the end of our current module. In this module, we discussed forecasting as a strategic tool. We discussed some of the benefits of setting a financial strategy. And we also went through an Excel template to spell out our financial strategy. Hello and welcome to module 203, Understanding the Business of our Financial Forecasting in Excel course. Let me explain the importance of understanding the business with a true story. My career started in the finance department of a large Swiss luxury retailer. A few months in the role, I was asked to come up with a proposal to forecast the financials of the company in the Middle East region. Keen to impress my manager, I left no stone unturned and came up with a thorough proposal, or so I thought. Umar, it's good, but you are missing one crucial element. My mind started racing. Financial statement analysis, check. Competitor analysis, check. Industry analysis. I was going through all the steps in my mind when suddenly my manager asks, how can you start with analyzing the financials and the industry before understanding the business? You gotta understand the business, he said. This was one of the most valuable lessons I have ever learned. Let's start our discussion on how exactly to understand the business. I will also introduce you to the company we will be using as a basis to create a financial forecast from the scratch. From now on, you will be hearing a lot about this company as you work through the course. A business is a complex web of people, processes, ideas, history, money, and so much more. It's therefore helpful to have a method for getting our arms around it. I prefer to use a method called the three dimensions of business understanding. These three dimensions don't so much break down and categorize the business. These three dimensions tell the inside story of the business. They expose the essence of the business and what makes it unique. The three dimensions of business understanding are the business profit model, the operating model of the business, and the competitive position. Firstly, the business model highlights the key profit drivers for the company. It provides insights into the relationship between revenues and costs, how they relate in terms of the company's operations, and ultimately what products and services are most profitable. It highlights cost advantages and disadvantages. Multiple companies may operate in the same general market space, but their specific business model and profit drivers differ substantially. Closely related to the basic business and profit model is the operating model. The operating model encompasses your company's philosophy, approach, and methods of operation. It also expresses how your organization uniquely gets things done. The final dimension of business understanding is competitive positioning. Competitive positioning describes how your company is uniquely equipped and configured to sell and service customers as opposed to its competitors. You might ask why these three dimensions are so important. From an M&A activity to operating system upgrades, knowledge of your organization's business model, operating model, and competitive positioning sets you up to deal with the senior leadership of your organization as a peer that is in touch with the most important aspects of the business. Knowledge of these three dimensions takes you beyond a basic understanding of business operations and into the heart of the organization's being. In a nutshell, with the command of these three dimensions of business understanding, 
you speak the same language as your peers and bosses. The question now becomes, how do you understand the business? My suggestion is do whatever it takes to get a solid hold on your company's business model, operating model and competitive positioning. You can start off by reading the company's financial statements and filings. You can also get copies of all operational and analytical reports. You can read trade journals, websites and analyst reports. You can attend or follow industry conferences. Most importantly, you need to know your business and operating model cold. With your newly acquired knowledge of the three dimensions of business understanding in hand, you are ready to put them to work in your upcoming efforts to form and create your financial forecast. I will be discussing how you can use the financial statements to understand the business in this module. In the next module, we will be discussing what sort of web research needs to be conducted and how it can be utilized to understand the business. Now, I will be introducing you to the company we will be using as a basis to create a financial forecast from the scratch. The company is called ABC, a multinational corporation headquartered in USA that designs, manufactures, markets and distributes vehicles and vehicle parts. It's a truly international company that produces vehicles in 40 countries. As far as the core offering is concerned, they design, build and sell trucks, crossovers, cars worldwide. ABC meets the demands of the customers in North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia and Africa with vehicles developed and marketed under the phenomenal Tucson and Buck brands. They also have equity ownership stakes in entity that meet the demands of customers primarily in China. The revenue contribution comes primarily from ABC North America, followed by Latin America and Europe. If we talk about the alternatives or the major competitors are companies like Volkswagen, Toyota, Tata, GM and Ford. And the principal factors that determine the consumer vehicle preferences in the markets in which ABC operates include overall vehicle design, price, quality, available options, safety, reliability, fuel economy, and functionality. The market leadership in individual countries in which they compete also varies widely. Before we look at the financial statements, please note that the idea is to get a general sense of the business. Don't get worried by looking at the cost lines and the amounts. We will be discussing that in the future modules. And the second point is around the extraction of the financial statements. Financial forecasts are prepared in Excel and the first steps start with knowing how the industry has been doing in the past years. The first step is to download all the financials of the company you want to forecast and populate it in an Excel sheet. Many times these tasks seem boring and tedious as it may take a lot of time and energy to format and put the data in Excel. However, populating the historicals helps an analysts understand the trends and the financial statements and it's really important. And the third point is around the recommended data set. I recommend to have at least five years of financial statement data at hand. And you will see that I have populated the financial statements from 2016 to 2020, which is five years of data. I have left 2021 through 2025 columns empty, and we will be forecasting for these years together. Now let's take a look at the financial statements of ABC Company. Let's start off with the income statement. It's in million USD except per share amounts that we see over here. The net sales were at the highest point in December 2016. The sales have gone down since 2016. And as of December 2020, the sales were at 122,485. Then we have the cost of sales. Backing out the cost of sales from the net sales, we arrive at the gross profit. The gross profit has also followed a similar trend to the sales 
Gross profit was at the highest point in December 2016 and has slowly decreased with time. We have the selling general and administrative expenses which have decreased since 2016 and then we have some minor other expenses. So our EBIT earnings before interest and taxes has slowly deteriorated. We back out the interest expense to arrive at the earnings before taxes. We take out the provision for income taxes and we have the net income including non-controlling interests. As of December 2020, it was $5,500. As you recall, we previously discussed that this company has an equity ownership stake in China. So if we back out that non-controlling interest, the net income attributable to ABC company is at $5,394 in December 2020, which is a substantial reduction from the December 16 net income of $7,075. So using the income statement, we get a general feel for how the company is doing. Then we take a look at the balance sheet. These are the current assets of the company, which includes the cash and cash equivalents, the receivables, inventories, and other current assets. Then we also have some additional assets, such as property, plant, and equipment, goodwill, some intangible assets, some deferred tax assets and other assets. If we add all these assets up, we arrive at the total assets, which were $109,504 as of December 20. Let's take a look at the liabilities and shareholders' equity. The total current liabilities are at $39,914, which is primarily comprised of the accrued income taxes and the accounts payable. The company also has a significant long-term debt and it has increased with time as you can see. There are some minor deferred income taxes. The company also has sizable other liabilities and if we add all these up we arrive at the total liabilities line and in the shareholders equity we have the additional paid in capital, the retained earnings and accumulated other comprehensive income, which are the biggest components of shareholders equity. Total shareholders equity is at $40,359. As you may recall, we had discussed the very important balance sheet equation where assets was equal to liabilities and shareholders equity. So if we have a quick look, the total assets were at $109,504 which is in line with what we have in December 20. I also have a check over here that does this calculation for us. And as you can see, assets are equal to the liabilities and shareholders equity. Now let's take a look at the cash flow statement. To arrive at the net cash provided by operations, we start off with the net income and then we make some adjustments to the net income. The biggest adjustments in this case is the depreciation and amortization adjustment that the company has made followed by the other operating activities cost line. We have some minor adjustments and various other cost lines as well. After making these adjustments, we arrive at the net cash provided by operations, which is positive for the past five years. We have the investing activities and that's primarily the capital expenditures and the proceeds from sale of marketable securities and investments. And then we also have some financing activities as you can see. The financing activities have decreased with time. Started off at $21,949 and it's down to $16,521. And the biggest factor for this decrease in financing activities is coming from the principal payments on debt. If you look at the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year, Cash and cash equivalents have been positive for all five years. They have even been trending upwards from under $10,000 in 2016 to $14,892 in December 2020. So these are the official financial statements of the company. This concludes module 203. To summarize, we discussed the dimensions of understanding a business, how to understand the business, 
and I also introduced you to the ABC company. We went through the financial statements of this company to get a general sense of the business. In the next module, we will continue with our discussion of understanding the business. Hello and welcome to Module 204, Understanding the Business of our Financial Forecasting in Excel course. As you may recall, in Module 203, we discussed different sources that can be used to understand the business. In the previous module, we went through the financial statements of ABC Company to get a general idea of the business. In this module, we will be going through some web research to understand the automobile sector that ABC operates in. The first article is called The Road to 2020 and Beyond, What's Driving the General Automotive Industry, published by McKinsey. The article starts by stating, overall, the global automotive industry is in better shape than before, especially in the US where profits and sales have recovered following the recent economic crisis, and in China, where growth remains strong. The progress will likely continue. By 2020, global profits for automotive OEMs are expected to rise by almost 50%. OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. The new profits will come mainly from growth in emerging markets, and to a lesser extent, the US. Europe, Japan, and South Korea will be stagnant in terms of profit growth. This chart shows the automotive profits now exceed pre-crisis levels, but the sources have changed. North America is in good shape. Profits have improved. Sales in North America reached 17 million units in 2012, the most in five years, the product mix has also started to shift to higher value pickups and SUVs. Finally, following some painful balance sheet and labor and non-cost restructurings, cost structure of leading OEMs have significantly improved, providing a basis for enhanced profitability. This chart is also interesting and it predicts that the next seven years will be profitable with emerging markets driving the majority of gains. Speaking of future challenges and opportunities, the increase in regulations with respect to environmental and safety standards will raise costs but also increase complexity as they need to be managed apart from domestic markets. Emerging markets share of global sales will rise from 50% in 2012 to 60% in 2020 while their share of global profits is also set to rise by 10 percentage points. When it comes to buying a car, research shows that digital trends are already the primary information source for customers. The industry landscape is also shifting, as OEMs seek to develop alternative powertrain technologies, suppliers will likely provide more of the value-added content per car. This is another interesting chart. The price growth at the pace of inflation plus added content have led to a decline in profit per vehicle. An analysis of 76 vehicle models shows that the prices have been almost flat in real terms since 1998, while more and more features and improvements have been added due to competition, customer demands, and regulation. The net effect has been a decline in profit per vehicle but OEMs have been able to manage this so far because they have been able to make efficiency and quality gains of 3 to 4% a year. However, tighter regulations for emissions or safety will add further costs to the average vehicle. The article also mentions that car buyers worldwide continue to be more and more demanding, seeking region-specific features, performance, and styling as an element of uniqueness even in mass market products as a way of differentiating and emphasizing individual taste and status. Carbon dioxide regulation is likely to continue to tighten and not just in Europe. China, the US and Japan have also enacted laws to reduce emissions. One immediate result will be higher costs. 
The after-sales market in China is also becoming more important. China is already the world's largest automobile market, but new car sales growth is slowing, from 18% a year between 2006 and 2012 to a projected 6% a year between 2012 and 2020. And the growth continues to shift. The automotive industry's economic center of gravity will continue to shift as sales volumes and market share keep moving toward emerging markets. The global sales share of established markets will decline from 50% in 2012 to 40% in 2020. These will account for only about 25% of future volume growth. The premium segment will account for more than half of future profit growth. And finally, internet connected cars are on the rise. The research article concludes by stating that future opportunities will outweigh the challenges. However, these developments will significantly drive changes in the industry over the next decade. OEMs that understand and anticipate those future challenges and opportunities and address them proactively and early will be better positioned to succeed in this complex industry. Now let's have a look at the competitors. As mentioned in Module 203, ABC has several competitors like GM, Daimler, Toyota, and Ford. Now let's take a look at the size of the companies in terms of market valuation and number of employees. Let's also look at some financial information and compare it with ABC. In this Excel spreadsheet, we have some data on the competitors of ABC. We have the valuation and the number of employees information along with some financial information. Firstly, the figures are as of December 2020 and they are in million USD except the number of employees. Looking at the valuation, it seems that ABC is below average. We arrive at the same conclusion using the number of employees metric. Looking at the financial information, we have the figures for revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit, and net income. We can compare the figures of ABC with other competitors, or we can have a look at the average as well. I also find financial ratios to be very important tools in order to gauge the profitability and compare it with other companies in the automobile sector. So over here we see that the gross profit margin, which is simply the gross profit divided by revenue for ABC is 12% and it's lagging the other companies. It's only above Ford. The gross profit margin is below average and then we can have a look at the net profit margin, which is simply the net profit divided by revenue. And we arrive at the same conclusion here, where ABC is slightly below the other companies, but in line with the average. Let's also review ABC's unit sales breakdown by regions and try to apply the knowledge we learned from the McKinsey article. As you may recall, according to that article, the product mix has started to shift to higher value pickups and SUVs. And we also see that development in the figures. As we see in 2020, trucks and crossovers were around 45% of the market share, and it has been increasing since 2018, where it was 44.8% of the overall market share. However, ABC has some catching up to do in China, where its market share has decreased since 2018. The market share was 13.7% and it has decreased to 11.6% in 2020. We also discussed that the profitability per vehicle is expected to decrease due to new regulation and tighter emission standards. This is expected to put further pressure on the profitability of ABC in the future. Let's also discuss the implications of our web research on ABC's financial statements. When we start forecasting in the future, we need to keep the increase in regulation in mind. 
because this is going to decrease the profitability of ABC. On the balance sheet side, the company might need to make some capital expenditures in property, plant and equipment to make more technologically advanced products. And it may need to take some more debt to finance these expenses. In the cash flow statement, the investments in property, plant and equipment will be visible in the capital expenditures cost line and the net cash used in investing activities will be forecasted to increase. The net cash used in financing activities can also be forecasted to increase as it covers a portion of these capital expenditures by issuing more debt. This concludes module 204. We conducted some web research to understand the business and we applied that research to ABC. Please note the more research you do, the better, as this will also enable you to understand the macroeconomic trends and forecast accurately. We also had a look at the competitors of ABC and concluded that ABC is not as profitable as some of its competitors and will face further pressure as the profitability per vehicle decreases. Hello and welcome to the first exercise of this course. As we discussed in the previous module, it's quite possible that the profitability decreases in the future years due to an increase in regulations. So let's assume that the profitability per vehicle is forecasted to decrease in 2021. As compared to 2020, the net revenue reduction per automobile manufacturer is provided over here. We also have the gross profit reduction per automobile manufacturer and finally, we have the net income reduction as well. So we need to calculate the following based on this new information. We need to calculate the revenue, the gross profit, the net income, and then the gross profit margin and the net profit margin. Please pause the video if you don't want to watch the answer straight away. Starting off with the revenue, we will use the revenue provided above times one plus the revenue reduction. For gross profit, it will be the original gross profit times one plus the gross profit reduction. For net income, it will be the net income provided times one plus the net income reduction. So for GM, for example, the revenue has reduced from 120,400 to 114,380. Similarly, the gross profit has reduced from 24,900 to 24,153. And the net income has reduced from $6,300 to $5,922. Let's apply the same formulas for the other automobile manufacturers, including ABC. We are just using the reduction per automobile manufacturer and multiplying it with the financials provided for 2020. Now we just need to calculate the gross profit margin and the net profit margin. And the formula is provided over here. So for the gross profit margin, we will divide the gross profit by the revenue. So for GM, it's 24,153 divided by the revenue of 114,380. We express this as a percentage. Similarly, the net profit margin is going to be the net income divided by the revenue. We also express this number as a percentage and we can now drag the formula across. With that, we have calculated the revenue, gross profit, net income, the gross profit margin and the net profit margin based on the assumed decrease in the profitability per vehicle. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Hello and welcome to module 206, going through ABC's balance sheet in our financial forecasting in Excel course. As you may recall, 
When I introduced you to ABC in the previous modules, I asked you not to get too concerned with the line items or the figures in the financial statements. Starting from this module, we'll dig deeper in the financial statements of ABC to thoroughly analyze the line items. I will admit that financial statements are not many people's idea of a riveting read. They can test even the most passionate and committed professionals. For many, the thought of a regular monthly review of the details of your company's financial reports is distinctly unappealing. However, spending time looking at the detailed performance is well worthwhile and will highlight areas for improvement, development, and opportunity. Businesses are made and broken on the financial decisions that are made. Too many of them are made on gut feel with very little account taken of data. The key business financial statements are a vital source of information. The three financial statements that are most commonly used to make a business decision are the balance sheet, the P&L or income statement, and the cash flow statement. Each has a very specific purpose and will give you an insight into a different part of the business. I will let you in on a little secret. Even though the income statement normally attracts the most attention, the balance sheet is the true starting point for understanding a company's financial position. It shows how much a business owns, owes, and how much equity is left over for the owners at a specific point in time. When a balance sheet is reviewed internally, it's designed to give insight into whether a company is succeeding or failing. When reviewing a balance sheet, you want to think next about what would happen if you were forced to liquidate an asset. By doing so, you'll need to look at whether a company's assets are tangible or intangible. Tangible assets are physical in nature and include cash, inventory, buildings, equipment, and accounts receivable. All current assets here are tangible assets. As you can see, ABC has cash and cash equivalents, receivables, inventories, and other current assets. These current assets are the sum of the carrying amounts as of the balance sheet dates of all assets that are expected to be realized in cash, sold, or consumed within one year. Apart from the current assets, ABC also has these non-current assets. ABC has significant property, plant, and equipment, which you would expect as the company is an automobile manufacturer. These amounts are net of accumulated depreciation, depletion, and amortization of physical assets used in the normal conduct of business to produce goods and services and are not intended for resale. Examples include land, buildings, machinery and equipment, office equipment, and furniture and fixtures that ABC owns. Moving on to the intangible assets. These assets often have real value, but you need to carefully examine them to ascertain the real value. If a company has made many acquisitions, for example, it could have a considerable amount of goodwill listed as an asset, or the amount it paid for a company in excess of the fair value of its net assets. However, as you can see, ABC does not have significant goodwill or even intangible assets. When reading a balance sheet, financial laymen are most often tripped up when revenue or expenses occur at a different time than the cash is received or paid. When this happens, a company faces a deferred asset or liability. For example, in this case, ABC has significant deferred tax assets. This is because the amount that ABC paid to the tax authorities is more than the tax expense on the income statement. And that's why we see a deferred tax asset on ABC's balance sheet. Other assets, as the name implies, are those assets which do not fall under any of the other categories. In ABC's case, these include fair value of cash equivalents and marketable debt securities such as government bond debts and corporate debt. These are not very material for ABC. Adding the current and the non-current assets, we arrive at the total assets line. Now let's have a look at the liabilities. 
Current liabilities are total obligations incurred as part of normal operations that are expected to be paid during the following 12 months or within one business cycle. ABC does not have significant loans to pay back. Looking at the accounts payable line, these represent ABC's obligations to pay off a short-term debt to its creditors. Accrued income taxes are income tax expenses that are recorded in accounting but have not yet been paid. Accrued expenses use the accrual method of accounting, meaning expenses are recognized when they are incurred, not when they are paid. Other liabilities in financial accounting are categories of short-term debt that are lumped together on the liability side of the balance sheet. That's what this line represents. Adding all these line items, we arrive at the total current liabilities line. Long-term debt is debt that matures in more than one year, and ABC is recording its long-term debt obligations in this line. ABC also includes deferred income tax liabilities which results from a difference in income recognition between tax laws and the company's accounting methods. So basically, ABC owes tax in different jurisdictions globally. In the other liabilities line, ABC is recording liabilities such as product warranties, revenue for products not delivered, and some employee benefits. Adding the current liabilities with these three line items, we arrive at the total liabilities line. Now let's take a look at the shareholders equity section of the balance sheet. On ABC's balance sheet, common stock is recorded at the stockholders equity section and it's the first line item. This is where investors can determine the book value or net worth of their shares, which is equal to the company's assets minus its liabilities. Additional paid in capital is the additional funding ABC has received from its shareholders by selling its stock. Retained earnings are an important concept in accounting. These amounts refer to the historical profits earned by ABC minus any dividends paid in the past. The word retained captures the fact that because these earnings were not paid out to shareholders as dividends, they were instead retained by the company. For this reason, Retained earnings decrease when a company either loses money or pays dividends and increase when new profits are created. Another spot on the balance sheet to review with a healthy dose of skepticism is other comprehensive income, which is included in the shareholders' equity. These figures reflect income and losses that have been left off the company's income statement. Foreign currency translations are kept here, for example. ABC, being a large company, operates in multiple jurisdictions internationally. Suppose it earns revenue in yen, but never actually exchanges that yen for dollars. Any unrealized foreign currency gains or losses will be listed under other comprehensive income. The unearned compensation line item refers to the employee stock awards, and for ABC, this line item is tiny. Adding all these line items, we arrive at the total shareholders' equity. Non-controlling interest is the ownership interest that ABC owns in other subsidiaries globally. That wraps up this section. We went through ABC's balance sheet and discussed the line items in detail. Remember my little secret. Balance sheet is the true starting point for understanding a company's financial position. Join me in the next module as we continue our discussion on ABC's financial statements. Hello and welcome. We will be going through ABC's income statement in our financial forecasting in Excel course. Now the income statement seems straightforward enough. Revenue at the top, expenses in the middle, and profit at the bottom, right? Sadly, the good old profit and loss gets botched up more than just about any other financial statement. Net sales refers to the revenue collected from customers by ABC. It is also called the top line. Some major sources of revenue include sale of vehicles, parts, and accessories. Cost of sales 
refers to the direct costs of producing the goods sold by the company. This amount includes the cost of materials and labor directly used to create the good. It excludes indirect expenses such as distribution costs and sales force costs. ABC records production of automobiles, parts and accessories in this cost line. Backing out the cost of sales from net sales, we arrive at gross profit. Selling general and administrative expenses, or SGNA for short, include all everyday operating expenses of running the business, and they are not included in the production of goods or delivery of services. Typical SGNA items for ABC include rent, salaries of employees, advertising and marketing expenses and distribution costs. Other income or expenses do not relate to the company's main business. In ABC's case, these minor amounts are due to losses from disposal of fixed assets. Backing out the selling general and administrative expenses and net other line, which is a loss in ABC's case, from the gross profit, we arrive at earnings before interest and taxes, or EBIT for short. Earnings before interest and taxes measure the profit a company generates from its operations. By ignoring taxes and interest expense, EBIT focuses solely on a company's ability to generate earnings from operations, ignoring variables such as the tax burden and capital structure. EBIT is an especially useful metric because it helps to identify a company's ability to generate enough earnings to be profitable, pay down debt, and fund ongoing operations. Now, EBIT is an important measure of a firm's operating efficiency because it does not take into account indirect expenses such as taxes and interest due on debts. It shows how much the business makes from its core operations. As we discussed previously, ABC has 177,000 employees globally. For these employees, ABC obviously incurs some costs other than salaries. Non-service related post-retirement costs include pension distributions paid to employees during their retirement years. Other post-retirement costs include life insurance and medical plans, or premiums for such benefits, as well as deferred compensation arrangements. An interest expense is the cost incurred by ABC for borrowed funds. Do you remember the long-term debt that we discussed on ABC's balance sheet? The interest expense on this line represents interest payable on that debt. It is essentially calculated as the interest rate times the outstanding principal amount of the debt. It is also worthwhile to note that an interest expense is a non-operating expense. Backing out these two line items from the EBIT, we arrive at Earnings Before Taxes, or EBT for short. EBT, or Earnings Before Taxes, is a calculation of ABC's earnings before taxes are taken out. The calculation is simply the revenue minus the expenses, excluding taxes. Earnings before taxes is an accounting measure of a company's operating and non-operating profits. It is also important to note that all companies calculate earnings before taxes in the same manner, and it is a pure ratio, meaning it uses the numbers found exclusively on the income statement. The provision for income taxes on an income statement is the amount of income taxes ABC estimates it will pay in a given year. There is a hint in the name. A tax provision is simply a type of provision that ABC has set aside to cover a probable future expense, income tax payment in this case. Deducting the provision for income taxes from earnings before taxes, we arrive at net income including non-controlling interests. Let me explain what a non-controlling interest is by looking at this line net income attributable to non-controlling interests. As the income statement is consolidated, 
all financial records of subsidiaries that a company owns are combined. ABC also has some subsidiaries abroad and it partially owns some of them. After consolidating the financial results, this line represents the portion of the income from those subsidiaries which ABC does not fully own. As you can see in this line, majority of the net income is attributable to ABC. This line is also called the bottom line. No matter how high the revenue, it's the bottom line that makes all the difference. We can summarize net income as sales minus cost of goods sold, selling general and administrative expenses, operating expenses, interest, taxes, and other expenses. It is a useful number to assess how much revenue exceeds the expenses of ABC. This number is a true measure of a company's profitability. That concludes module where we went through ABC's income statement and had a look at all the line items. Join me in the next module as we discuss ABC's cash flow statement. Hello and welcome to module 208 where we will be going through ABC's cash flow statement in our financial forecasting in Excel course. The cash flow statement provides information about a company's cash receipts and cash payments during an accounting period, showing how these cash flows link the ending cash balance to the beginning cash balance shown on the company's balance sheet. Watch till the end of this module and you'll know what I mean. The cash flow statement consists of three parts. Cash flows provided by operating activities, cash flows provided by investing activities, and the cash flows for financing activities. Let's discuss these three sections starting from the net cash provided by operations. This is the first section of the cash flow statement and it covers cash flows from operating activities. Companies are able to generate sufficient positive cash flow for operational growth. If there is not enough cash flow generated, they may need to secure financing for external growth in order to expand. This section reports cash flows and outflows that stem directly from ABC's main business activities. These activities may include buying and selling inventories and supplies, along with paying employees' salaries and other operating activities. Any other forms of in and outflows such as investments, debts, and dividends are not included here and are included in the sections below. Let's take a look at an example. Accounts receivable is a non-cash account. If accounts receivable go up during a period, it means sales are up, but no cash was received at the time of sale. The cash flow statement deducts receivables from net income because it is not cash. The cash flows from operations section can also include accounts payable, depreciation and amortization, and numerous prepaid items booked as revenues or expenses, but with no associated cash flow. You will also notice that there is a flow to the cash flow from operations section. The cash flows from operations section begins with net income, including non-controlling interests, and then reconciles all non-cash items to cash items. So in other words, Cash flow from operations is ABC's net income, but in a cash version. Let's move to the second section of the cash flow statement. This is the cash used in investing activities section. This section includes transactions that are a result of investment gains and losses. This section also includes cash spent on property, plant and equipment, this line item is important to find changes in capital expenditures. ABC also has some purchases of marketable securities and investments along with some proceeds which are also included here. ABC being an automobile manufacturer is capital intensive. As capex increases, it generally means there is a reduction in cash flows which you can see here. But that is not always a bad thing. 
as it may indicate that ABC is making investments into its future operations. It can be a sign of growth. Other smaller line items here are the trading of marketable securities and other investments. As you can see, the purchases and proceeds from the sale of these investments are recorded here. All in all, the CFI is negative primarily due to investments in CapEx. Another point to note here is that while positive cash flows within this section can be considered good, analysts would prefer companies that generate cash flow from business operations, not through investing and financing activities. Companies can generate cash flow within this section by selling equipment or property. The cash flows from financing or CFF is the last section of the cash flow statement. The section provides an overview of cash used in business financing. It measures cash flow between a company and its owners and creditors, and its source is normally from debt or equity. These figures are generally reported annually on a company's 10K report to shareholders. Analysts use the cash flow from financing section to determine how much money the company has paid out via dividends or share buybacks. ABC has recorded the dividends paid on this line and purchases of treasury shares on this line. Cash obtained or paid back from capital fundraising efforts such as equity or debt is listed here as well, as are loans taken out or paid back. Major line items here include the principal payments on debt and proceeds from issuance of debt. The cash flow from financing is a positive number, which means there is more money coming into the company than flowing out. When the number is negative, it may mean the company is paying off debt or making dividend payments or stock buybacks. Adding the figures from the net cash provided by operations, net cash provided by investing, and net cash used in financing activities, we arrive at the net increase or decrease in cash and cash equivalents. If we add the cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the year to the net increase or decrease in cash equivalents, we arrive at the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year. Do you recall my secret hint when we were discussing ABC's balance sheet? I mentioned that the balance sheet is the starting point when analyzing the financials of a company. Let me show you how. Do you see the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year line? If we go to the balance sheet, we will see that the figures are exactly the same. Let me paste the figures from the balance sheet here so that you can see for yourself. So in this line, I copied and pasted the cash and cash equivalents from the balance sheet. And you can see that the cash and cash equivalents from the cash flow statement at the end of the year are exactly the same. And in order to calculate the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year, we had to start with the net income, including non-controlling interests that comes from the income statement. But when we go through the financial statements, I recommend starting off with the balance sheet. Hope you enjoyed this section. We went through the CFO, CFI, and CFF sections of the cash flow statement. We also saw how the three financial statements are interrelated. Hello and welcome to module 301, defining your forecasting objectives in our financial forecasting in Excel course. If you aim for nothing, that's probably what you'll get. A forecast is a roadmap of what you're aiming to achieve and how you intend to get there. It provides a lot of insight as to the resources and milestones needed to reach your goals. By defining our objectives, we are putting a foundation in place to build a forecast that adds value to the company. Now let's define our forecasting objectives for ABC Company. Think of this as the planning phase, where we'll plan and design the ultimate end product and build a foundation that supports our forecasting goals. For ABC, our forecasting objectives are as follows. We would like to build 
core financial statements. We want to make the forecasting process reliable. The third objective is to ensure forecasts are driving senior management decision making. And lastly, objective four is about ensuring our forecasts can be easily updated and published monthly. You see, ABC as a company wants to grow and become a more metrics-driven organization. Our financial forecasts should help plan and manage the key drivers or metrics of financial performance at the overall company level. The idea here is to drive focus down to the more operational levels of the different divisions of the company. Think of the big picture mentality here that we have discussed previously. If ABC has to increase its sales globally and take on more debt to help finance this growth, our forecasts should help in answering these questions. This is only possible if we become more focused on the key drivers of financial performance to ensure the growth is profitable and also our forecast should help manage the risk associated with taking on more debt. Therefore, our forecast is going to be an important tool to manage both financial performance and risk on a monthly basis. The forecast should help plan and manage different subsidiaries at the overall company level. Objective 4 is critical. We need to ensure that our forecasting exercise is not too difficult to maintain and provides continuous benefits on an ongoing basis. Now let's move on to our Excel file to see how we can achieve these objectives. This detailed Excel file will be used to create a financial forecast. The primary approach taken in this forecasting guide is modular. The modular system essentially means building core statements like the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement using different modules or Excel sheets. As you can see, we have the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement in separate tabs. On this tab, we have the balance sheet, then we have the income statement in a separate tab, and the cash flow statement also has its own tab. The key focus is to prepare each statement step by step and connect all the supporting tabs to the core statements on completion. It is completely normal if it's not clear right now. However, you will realize that this is very easy as we move forward in our course. Please note the following important points. By core statements, I mean the balance sheet, income statement, and the cash flow statement. You will also see that there are other tabs in this file as well, such as the working capital tab, depreciation capex tab, amortization intangible tab, and the other long-term asset liability tab. These different schedules are linked to the core statements upon completion. Therefore, in summary, we will be using this Excel file to build a step-by-step -step integrated forecast of ABC from the scratch. We also discussed that forecasts should help drive senior management decision making. In this file, we will be using various analyses such as ratio analysis and trend analysis for measuring relative performance year over year and ensure management has all the information required to make strategic decisions and manage risk and profitability. You can see the different trend analysis and financial ratios in the balance sheet and income statement tabs. For instance, if we look at the balance sheet tab, we will see that we have a number of financial ratios under the balance sheet. We will be discussing the solvency ratios, the turnover ratios, and the most important inventory days ratios. Moving on to the income statement, we will be conducting a number of analysis such as the vertical analysis, the horizontal analysis, and the trend analysis as well. Lastly, I would just like to reiterate that if you want to effectively manage business finances, always keep an eye on the balance sheet, income statement or the P&L statement, and the cash flow statement. 
That concludes Module 301. We discussed why financial forecasting is a critical part of business planning. Even though businesses face many events that are unpredictable, it is very possible to put plans in place that would prevent such events or at the very least ensure that outcomes from such events are kept to a minimum. If you are working with accurate forecasts, you will be able to learn from the past and more accurately predict the future. It will keep you looking ahead, making you more likely to foresee market changes and competitive challenges. In this module, we also completed the very important milestone of spelling out our objectives for ABC. These written objectives will help us keep focused on what we want to accomplish in our forecasting exercise. Hello and welcome to Module 302, Identifying our forecasting approach and assessing time frames in our financial forecasting in Excel course. Before determining the most appropriate forecasting approach for ABC company, let's discuss key forecasting approaches. I like to classify forecasts into three main categories, namely historical forecasting, research-based forecasting, and qualitative forecasting. When you use your financial history to plot the future, that's historical forecasting that you're applying. You're looking at your last few annual income statements, cash flow statements, and balance sheets to see how fast you have grown in the past. From there, you can make a guess about how fast you'll grow this year. The benefit of this is that it's relatively easy to do and doesn't take a lot of time, money, or expertise. The drawback is that you're only using information about your own company and not looking at the broader market trends, like what your competition has been up to. Historical forecasting is a good bet if you're forecasting for modest growth or else creating a quick and dirty forecast for your own use. It is also more appropriate for established companies. Then we have research-based forecasting. When you do research about broader market trends, you're using research-based forecasting. You may look at how your industry has performed over the past 10 years, investigate new technologies and consumer trends, or try to measure the progress of your competitors. You might also look at how companies similar to yours have planned their own growth. The benefit of research-based forecasting is that you get a detailed, nuanced view of how your business could grow taking into account a lot of different factors. And it's the kind of forecast that investors and lenders want to see. The drawback is that research-based forecasting can be expensive. You may find you need to hire outside consultants and researchers to handle the heavy lifting. Research-based forecasting is a good choice if you are courting investors or planning on rapid, aggressive growth. It's also good if your company is brand new and doesn't have a lot of financial history to draw on for making projections. And lastly, we have qualitative financial forecasting. Qualitative forecasting, as the name implies, uses non-quantifiable or non-measurable data for forecasting purposes. For instance, the manager may give due importance to the consumer opinion or expert judgment for arriving at suitable results. These methods are widely used when the past data is not available. For example, it would be wise to research consumer preferences while launching a new product in the market. Let's go to our Excel sheet and determine the most appropriate forecasting approach. If we have a look at the ABC business model, we may recall that ABC is a multinational corporation that produces vehicles in 40 countries. It's a truly global organization. If we have a quick look at the figures on the balance sheet, we'll see that ABC company had assets worth 109,504 at the end of December 20. So it's an established company with significant assets to its name. If we have a look at the income statement, again over here we'll see that as of December 2020, company had net sales of around $122,485. And remember that these figures are in million USD. So effectively, the company had $122 billion of net sales. 
at the end of December 2020. So now we know that the company is established and has a lot of financial data available. Now let's go back to the presentation and see which one of the three approaches is the most appropriate in case of ABC. Any guesses? Among the three, historical forecasting approach is the most appropriate as ABC is an established company. Qualitative and research-based forecasting are beyond the scope of this course. It's also important to discuss historical and future timeframes when forecasting. When we talk about historical forecasting, you need to consider how many months or years of historical financial statements have to be included in the forecast. When possible, two to three years of historical monthly results is necessary because they provide insights into the drivers of results, trends over time, and month-to-month -month variations in results. These numbers help you assess where the company has been according to the actual results. Note that five years of data is even better because it can capture more trends and you can evaluate how a company has performed in line with its long-term strategy. As you may recall, that's exactly why we chose five years of historical data for ABC. Now let's talk about future forecasting periods. Typically, forecast periods are monthly for the upcoming 12 to 18 months. Although there are times when you may want to forecast further into the future, 12 to 18 months is sufficient for month-to-month -month decision-making process. However, in this course, we will be discussing how to forecast up to five years into the future. It is also important to maintain the 12 to 18 month forecast horizon as each month goes by. For example, let's say you begin the process with 18 months in your forecast. Once the first month goes by, you now have 17 months in the forecast. The forecast horizon shrinks each month unless you regularly add months to the end of the forecast horizon. This process of maintaining the number of periods in the forecast is what makes the forecast a rolling forecast. A rolling forecast simply means that when a month is over, you add a month to the end of the forecast period. That way, you always have a defined period in your forecast. From experience, I can tell you that rolling forecasts are absolutely necessary to ensure that a business is headed in the right direction. It helps you think in terms of a more practical planning horizon rather than the traditional compliance-driven reporting periods. It's also worthwhile mentioning here that forecasts have to be flexible. Forecasts are there to answer questions and adapt to things outside our control. That's why it is not always necessary to adhere to the strictest definition of a rolling forecast. It's preferable to allow some flexibility in defining and updating the forecast horizon. At the end of the day, it really depends on what's going on in the business, the nature of the planning cycle, and the types of decisions the forecast informs. From personal experience, while working as a controller for a major logistics company, we used to create two forecasts, one for the short term and the other one for the long term. This forecasting process was similar when I moved to a bank. Please remember that when it comes to how frequently to update the numbers in the forecast period, I encourage you to look at the forecast period as consisting of the short term and the long term. The short term is the next three to 12 months or so. The long term would be the next 12 to 60 months or five years. Now let's discuss these timeframes while looking at our Excel template. So when we talk about the short term horizon, this would mean the next year. The longer term horizon would be from December 22 to December 25. Note that the basic fundamentals of forecasting in the short and the long term are the same. For ABC, we will be focusing more on longer term forecasting along with the core concepts of shorter term rolling forecasts. This concludes the current module. In this module, we discussed the various forecasting approaches and identified the most appropriate forecasting approach for ABC. We also discussed short-term and long-term forecasting horizons. When discussing timeframes, 
It's useful to think of the types of questions that short-term and long-term forecasts attempt to answer. Short-term forecasts answers questions like, what's about to happen? You want your leadership team and the other users of the forecast to have a clear view of what financial results are likely to be in the near future. As a result, pay very close attention to the next 3 to 12 months in the forecast and update those numbers monthly. The longer term is more about answering the question, what could happen? This is more of a what happens if kind of question. What happens if ABC expands their operations? What needs to happen for ABC to double its sales? These numbers would generally be updated only when there is an event or something has happened in the business that makes it necessary to change the forecast. Hello again and welcome to the second exercise of our financial forecasting in Excel course. In this exercise, we need to determine the most relevant data needed to calculate our financial forecasts. We are currently in August 2019 and we need to forecast the 2020 financials for XYZ company and create a 12 month rolling forecast. For XYZ, we have the following financial data available. Please pause the video if you don't want to watch the answers straight away. In order to create a 2020 financial forecast, we know from the previous modules that we require five years of historical information. So for 2020, we need to have financial statements from 2015 through 2019. So let me highlight that. And to create a 12 month rolling forecast in August 2019, we need to have the monthly financial data from September 2018 through August 2019. You can count, this is 12 months of data, and that's exactly what we require in our 12 months rolling forecast. Hello and welcome to module 304, determining the key variables and drivers in our financial forecasting in Excel course. Forecasting is dynamic rather than static as financial predictions are based on internal and external drivers, using business rules to link line items, business functions, and time periods. People normally associate identifying key drivers and variables with budgets rather than forecasts. Let me explain the importance of identifying key drivers and variables in forecasts by distinguishing between budgets and forecasts. I like to think of budgets as maps, static in nature, and detailing expected future results. Forecasting, on the other hand, is sort of like a map application. Think of Waze or Google Maps. Take your pick. Forecasts provide you with the tools to adjust in how you get to your destination. Forecasts are constantly sensitive to any movement in the internal and external drivers that impact future financial performance and they are always ready to trigger alarm bells. To forecast effectively, perhaps the most critical aspect in building a dynamic forecasting model is identifying the drivers to incorporate. We will start our discussion on how to identify important drivers in our financial forecast. The concept of identifying key drivers and variables is known as driver-based forecasting. Driver-based forecasting is characterized by using formulas that rely on a thorough understanding of the relationship between the independent and dependent variables used to model outcomes. A simple example of driver-based modeling is forecasting sales by using a rate multiplied by units formula. A big strength of driver-based models is that they allow for quick and easy what-if analysis. All you need to do to see the results of different scenarios is to change a variable and the results flow through your model to let you see the outcome. These models provide great flexibility, but they require a deep understanding on the part of the modeler of how the variables affect each other. These models can also require more time upfront to develop as opposed to judgment-based or statistical models. 
That's why it's important to take our time in understanding the concept and the key steps in following the driver-based forecasting approach. When creating a driver-based model, it is important to produce one that is not overly detailed or complex, but one that is accurate and actionable. We can easily get lost in the details, but we need to avoid complexity that is introduced by adding variables unnecessarily if they do not provide analytical benefits. Starting with the chart of accounts is not a good idea. The model should focus on key performance drivers. The most important step in driver-based forecasting is to identify the key drivers to include in the financial forecast. Every planning professional I've ever met is familiar with the Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. It simply says that roughly 20% of inputs account for 80% of outputs. The interesting thing is, most people I've met routinely ignore this principle. A little analysis will tell you where the 20% are in your business. This will then be your focus when you're designing your driver-based model. You may not need to use driver-based planning for every item you want to forecast. Let your 80-20 analysis steer your modeling. Your planning should integrate the operational elements of the business, not just the financial data from the general ledger. Many of the drivers you will want to evaluate include non-financial, operational variables. Some examples of financial drivers may include price, volume, margins, or cost of goods sold. Some examples of operational drivers include call volume, employee turnover, or service levels. One of the best ways to gain a deep understanding of the operational drivers is to get out of your office and get into the operations of your business. Simply observe how the business operates and you can then determine what makes the needle move in the business. For instance, let's say you want to create a financial forecast for a reservations department of an airline. Let's apply the 80-20 rule here. What moves the needle in this business? The most appropriate starting point would be to spend some time observing reservation agents taking calls and booking flights. This will enable you to understand exactly what variables affected the call volume, average talk time, and a variety of other variables in turn helping you immeasurably when you start building a driver-based forecast model for the reservations department. Now let's apply this driver-based forecasting approach to our airline reservations department example. Imagine you are in that department. What would you observe? Well, you might see reservation agents making reservations for customers based on their various requirements and budgetary allowances. Or there would be some agents assisting and advising customers, sorting out any issues that may arise with the bookings. Some reservation agents will be selling and promoting reservation services. Others would be processing payments and sending confirmation details. A few reservation agents might be checking the availability of accommodation or transportation on the customer's desired travel dates. Ultimately, we need to see what moves the needle in this case. What are all reservation agents aiming to achieve? In terms of financial forecasting, it's the call volumes and the time spent on calls that really moves the needle for this reservations department. So using a quick and easy what if analysis, you have determined that time spent and call volumes are the most important drivers in your forecast. Calls that have been missed by reservation agents, on the other hand, do not add any direct value to your forecast. So calls missed should be excluded from your model. In the end, the most important key driver to be included in the financial forecast is the time spent on calls. That wraps up the current module. In this module, we discuss the importance of making our forecast more dynamic by identifying key variables and drivers 
and utilizing a driver-based forecasting approach. This is an essential component to plan our financial forecast. Join me in the next modules as we continue our discussion and apply these principles to ABC Company. Hello and welcome to module 305 where we continue our discussion of determining key variables and drivers in our financial forecasting in Excel course. Let's start off by discussing the steps required to build a driver-based model. The first thing we would do when building a driver-based model is the 80-20 analysis that we discussed previously. First, we figure out what we are going to model because it is not going to be the entire chart of accounts. Once you know the output you're looking for, it's time to go into discovery mode. That's where the operational experience comes in. Talk to people in the departments involved to understand the things that drive the outcome you're planning for. If you're forecasting sales, talk to the vice president of sales and some managers in the sales department maybe even some salespeople who are the ones racking up the sales. Gain an understanding of the sales cycle. What are the things that affect prices, discounts given, receivables terms, chargebacks, sales volume, the timing of various promotions, and so on. These are all the things that can affect your projection, so you better understand them. In step three, we put the variables to work. That's where we build our model. We need to be organized and develop our formulas based on what we have learned in the discovery process. Let what you learned drive the level of detail in which to build your financial forecast. For example, if sales prices don't vary, it's sufficient to set up a price list and use that to drive all the formulas that involve sales price. If, on the other hand, your business runs lots of promotions or routinely gives discounts, you'll want to build your formulas to incorporate these variables so that you are not constantly reworking the model when things change. That's the whole purpose for using this method. It allows us the flexibility. Effective forecasting starts with identifying the key drivers that drive the business forward. The important thing is to select drivers that have a major impact on the financial performance and focus on those that are measurable and can be acted upon. This needs to be a collaborative effort so that everyone understands which pieces of the forecasting model they own and are responsible for maintaining. In my experience, if you're trying to do this in isolation, you risk ending up with a black box that people will not buy into and you will not realize the full value of adopting such an approach. Here is the five point checklist for using drivers in forecasting models. The first step starts with modeling revenue. Revenue forecasting varies by industry and could involve modeling various drivers such as average selling price, market size, market share, and market growth across multiple channels, organizational units, and geographies. Most businesses measure revenue at least monthly. However, it is not always so straightforward and may require an additional level of modeling where the number of sales calls or the amount of web traffic are important factors in revenue generation. Once reliable conversion rates are established and the average sales value is known, activity and inquiry levels can be used to forecast turnover remembering that it may take many months before an inquiry turns into revenue. The second tip is around limiting drivers to forecast variable expenses. Drivers such as input prices, productivity ratios, and even staff turnover have an important role in modeling the key variable expenses such as travel, staffing costs, and other demand-driven consumables. They are not so applicable for forecasting line items that are essentially fixed, and it is best to avoid artificially pushing the logic if there is no obvious driver to bring into play. Use a traditional approach, such as a percentage of revenue, to forecast these line items. Thirdly, 
we need to forecast the practical rather than theoretical. Modeling revenues and operating expenses are the two areas where drivers are most applicable to forecasting. This causal relationship between the amount of activity, such as the number of sales inquiries, and its subsequent impact on revenue are well understood and can be reliably measured. The same cannot be said of customer satisfaction or consumer sentiment. Many companies periodically measure customer satisfaction, but unless the results can be used to model how changes in levels of satisfaction directly impact customer retention and subsequently revenue, my view is that incorporating it as a driver in forecasting model is pushing the envelope a tad too far. Incorporating sentiment analysis is even more problematic as there is very little data available about the demographics of those active in social media and no way of knowing whether they are part of your target audience. The fourth tip is around avoiding unnecessary complexity and it goes in the same direction as the third tip. We need to appreciate the differences between industries and business models and it is not surprising that there are no hard and fast rules on the number of drivers to use in forecasting models. Restricting the use of drivers to only those elements of revenues or expenses that have a major impact on profitability will obviously make it easier to maintain models. But anyone overwhelmed by the complexity should remember that often a single driver, such as number of sales orders, impacts the workload and resourcing needed across a number of different departments, such as order processing, dispatch, and receivables. You can think of the fifth tip as the summary of the four tips we have just discussed. We need to include critical external drivers. Good forecasting models should incorporate quantified figures for market size and market growth, and perhaps even some of the higher order factors that directly impact them. We will certainly keep this in mind when forecasting for ABC. That concludes the current module. In this module, we discuss the steps required to build a driver-based forecast. We also discuss the tips useful for determining key drivers in forecasting. Join me in the next module as we apply these principles to our financial forecast of ABC. Hello and welcome to module 306, the last part of our key variables and drivers discussion in our financial forecasting in Excel course. In the previous two modules, we discussed the theory around determining these key variables and drivers for forecasting purposes. In this module, we will look at ABC's financial statements and apply the theory we discussed. To refresh our memory, let's quickly go through the theory that we discussed and then we will move on to ABC's financial statements. In driver-based forecasting, the idea is to do a quick and easy what-if analysis by avoiding complexity, thereby enabling us to identify key drivers that are to be included in the financial forecast. These are the tips that we discussed in identifying drivers for forecasting purposes. Once we identify our key drivers, we will go through the discovery phase and then process those variables. Let's move on to ABC's financial statements. Firstly, we have to forecast the net sales as we need to determine the profitability for the future years. And it all starts with the top line. So net sales is a key component that needs to be forecasted. While going through the Excel file, it's also worth noting that ABC has provided a sales breakdown by geographic location. ABC has a significant market share in North America. The market share in North America stands at 16.5% as of 2020. And the worldwide market share for ABC is at 10.22%. The market share has gone up from the prior years. 
Moving on to the income statement, we see that ABC has provided some segment level information. In the first section, ABC provides us the sales breakdown of automobiles and parts. This is broken down further by geographic location. And in the second section, ABC provides us details into the sales of their trucks. The figures that ABC has provided are in blue and the percentage amounts in black are the year-over-year -year growth rates for each element. These are simply the sales in the current year compared to the sales in the prior year. For example, if we take 2019 as a baseline, in North America, ABC had $53,522 worth of sales and in the prior year it was at $60,290. This means that in December 2019 the sales have gone down by 11.2%. This approach is applied to all other segments as well. Another important point to note is that the net sales shown over here should be in line with the revenue disclosed on the income statement. Let's have a look and see if that is the case. These are the figures reported as net sales on the income statement. If I copy them and I paste them here, we can see that these figures are in line. Since we do not have any further information about the net sales, we will project the future sales of ABC on the basis of this available data. We will use the sales growth approach across these segments to derive the forecasts. And to calculate our future forecasts, we will use these historical growth rates. Remember, as we discussed, the aim is to avoid complexity and keep the forecast as flexible as possible. In this case, the growth rate is our key driver and we can change it to adjust the future forecasts as needed. So we will be using the historical growth rates to model sales forecasts in the future. Do you remember when we were discussing the ABC business, we noted that the automobile sector is changing rapidly and smart mobility is a key theme in this sector. This sector is also expected to have further regulation in the future. These are the non-financial drivers for ABC. Also note that as this is relatively recent data, by using these year-over-year -year growth rates, we are implicitly capturing some of the non-financial drivers such as the number of regulations and the percentage of smart mobility sales that has had an impact on the historical sales of ABC. Now let's discuss how we will forecast costs for ABC using the information that we have available. We have discussed how to forecast net sales. Now let's see how we can forecast the other line items. Since we do not have any other information available, we can project the other line items as a percentage of sales. This is the historical forecasting approach and the idea here is to take the guidelines from the historical cost and expense margins and then forecast the future margins. The same approach will be applied to selling general and administrative expenses and other line items as well. And please keep in mind that using this historical forecasting approach, we are limiting drivers to forecast variable expenses thereby reducing unnecessary complexity in the process. For balance sheet, in order to forecast for the future, we will be using the information from the income statement to forecast the balance sheet line items. How, you ask? Well, we will be utilizing various ratios such as the turnover ratios in order to do that. These turnover ratios will compare the dollar amount of sales or revenues to ABC's total assets. For instance, in the receivables turnover ratio, we will compare the sales amount to the receivable amount in the balance sheet to forecast for the future. We will apply the same principle to the inventory turnover and the payables turnover, simply comparing 
sales in the year to the inventory or payables respectively. After we have forecasted the various balance sheet line items such as receivables, inventories, other current assets using the turnover ratios, we will then shift our attention to the cash flow statement where we can fill in various line items such as the cash effects of changes in the receivables, inventories, accounts payable and so on for the future years. The idea here is to use whatever historical information we have available. In some line items, we may need to make some assumptions, such as in the property, plant and equipment line. We will discuss these assumptions in the future modules. Now let's go back to our presentation. Let's summarize the driver-based planning approach that we applied to ABC. In step one, we identified that the financial drivers are price, volume, and margins, and the non-financial drivers are regulations and disruptions that we have also discussed previously. In step two, which is the discovery phase, the key components of forecasting are sales, the cost of goods sold or COGS, selling general and administrative expenses or SGNA, and net income. We also discussed that by using historical growth rates, we are implicitly capturing the non-financial drivers, such as the number of regulations and the percentage of smart mobility sales. We also briefly discussed how we can process these variables. In order to forecast the financials of ABC, the idea is to use as much historical information that we have available. We will be forecasting sales, SGNA, balance sheet, and cash flow statement using this information. However, please note that we may need to make some assumptions when we discuss individual line items. The idea over here is to plan our forecast. That wraps up the current module. In this module, we applied the concepts of driver-based forecasting to ABC. We also planned our forecasting approach, which will be discussed in further detail in the future modules. Hello and welcome to module 307 of our financial forecasting in Excel course. The next section is all about creating our financial forecast for ABC. Therefore, I believe it's quite important to discuss some key points before we dive into the calculations and create our forecast. In this module, we will be discussing the forecasting approach and how it all ties together, color convention, and the sales forecasting methodology. Starting off with the forecasting approach, we will first forecast the revenue and the expenses to create the income statement. The next step will be to complete the calculations of the supporting schedules. You need to think of these supporting schedules as the backbone of our forecasting model. There are a number of supporting schedules that we will be discussing. These include the working capital schedule, depreciation, capital expenditures and intangible calculations, the shareholders equity schedule, long-term assets and liabilities, and finally, the debt schedule. After we have created the income statement and the supporting schedules, we will combine the forecasted income statement and these schedules to arrive at the forecasted cash flow statement and the balance sheet. I believe this forecasting approach will help you to keep the big picture in mind and also understand how all the work in the next section comes together. Secondly, I will also encourage you to make full use of the Excel spreadsheet provided with this course and work with me while we go through the modules in the next section. The next point I want to discuss is around color coding. As you will see in the Excel spreadsheet provided with this course, there are several tabs and it's easy to get lost in the details. That's why I believe using different colors for numbers will ensure we understand exactly where the numbers will be coming from. Color coding text in Excel gives context to the data. Merely glancing at the spreadsheet can help you understand what kind of data you're working with. Therefore, 
I will be using green for formulas with links to other worksheets within the same file. Black will be used for calculations we will be making. And blue will be used for constants and hard-coded numbers like historical data and assumptions. I will give you a couple of reminders when we start using this color coding in the next section. In the last part of this module, let's discuss a sales forecasting methodology that can be used to forecast the sales for any corporation. Note that for ABC, we will be assuming growth rates for forecasting sales, but using this methodology, will help you understand how to calculate forecasted sales from the scratch. The most practical method for forecasting sales is to base your projections on historical sales results and your experience. We need to gather the company's past income statements. I propose you go back several years. Sales data from income statements over the last few years has more predictive power than just using last year's sales to forecast this year's sales. Using the income statement data, you can calculate the sales growth rate from year to year. Divide the current sales by the prior year sales. Analyze various factors that impact sales to gain a better understanding of why sales grew or slowed from year to year. Determine the cause and effect relationship of variables such as customer demand, worker productivity, advertising and promotion. For example, hiring an additional salesperson has an impact on sales. Demographic trends such as influx of consumers with high household incomes can also have an effect on sales. Greater advertising and promotion affect sales as well. We can then identify external factors that affect sales. External factors include general economic environment or macroeconomic trends such as unemployment, interest rates, consumer sentiment, and inflation. Other macroeconomic trends include the level of competition. A greater number of competitors can potentially depress your company's sales, which you must forecast in your sales projections. We then apply a growth rate for sales based on the sales model. You can compare your sales forecast with actual sales results. If your projections were off, go back and look at your various assumptions. Your goal should be to forecast sales within a reasonable margin of error. Analyze sales on a regular basis and make adjustments accordingly. You project an annual sales growth rate, but review your projections on a monthly basis to adjust your numbers and get a more accurate determination of sales for the upcoming months. And finally, make adjustments to account for seasonality of sales. Look at extenuating circumstances specific to your business. If you run an ice cream parlor, summer sales usually outweigh winter sales. If you run an office supply store, increase your sales projections to account for back to office promotions. Tweak your sales growth projections around your personal experience. Now let's apply this methodology to calculate the sales growth rate. Let's say we have sales data from financial statements. In 2018, the sales number was at $1,000. In 2019, it was at $1,100. And then in 2020, it was at $1,150. The sales growth rate is then simply $1,150 divided by $1,000, which gives us a growth rate of 5% per year. This is our starting point. After analyzing the variables such as product mix sales and demographics, we deduce that the new product is expected to further increase sales by 1%. Based on external factors, we can gain an additional 0.5% sales by marketing our products aggressively. Our seasonality assumption is that Q4 sales are the highest in the year. We then discuss the results internally and review the sales model and are informed that the management of the company wants sales to grow by another 0.25%. Please note that sales model can also mean sales targets. So in this example, we can say that we discussed the sales targets with the management and the management decided that the sales will grow by another 0.25%. Let's have a look at the new sales forecast now. The total sales growth will be the 5% plus the 1% plus the 0.5% and then the 0.25%, which gives us a sales growth rate of 6.75%. The forecasted sales in 2021 would then be the sales in 2020 times the sales growth rate. 
The sales in 2020 were $1150. We multiplied by the growth rate of 6.75% to arrive at the forecasted sales of 1227.6 USD. We are now at the end of the current module. In this module, we discussed some key points to consider for the next section when we start building our forecast for ABC. I would like to reiterate that we assumed some growth rates for forecasting ABC sales in the next section, but in this module, we discussed the important concepts for arriving at the sales forecast for any corporation. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.